So we didn't get very far in this lecture, so I'm going to start from the top. And we were kind of talking about, uh, you know, we talk about Islam not just as a religion, but laying the foundation of a new civilization. And this also is reflected in architecture and art. And in some ways, then, uh, if we're thinking about architecture, part of it is also about kind of, you know, establishing the idea that Islam is something unique, something different from what came before. Uh, even if sometimes borrowing a bit from what was already on the ground. Uh, probably one of the earliest structures that we can really talk about being somehow purely Islamic might be the Dome of the Rock, uh, which is located in Jerusalem. This, uh, the structure going back to 691. So this is very early on in the, uh, during the Umayyad Caliphate. Uh, and so the dome itself probably does reflect uh, some Christian influence, for instance, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which already existed and had a dome. Uh, but in other respects, it really is starting to look like something very unique in terms of the kind of geometrical structure. Probably really important in this regard is the interior decoration, uh, which you can see to the right. Uh, so from a pretty early point, there's this kind of, uh, I don't want to say uh, prohibition against uh, the depiction of living things in art, though that is seen somehow as an act of creation, something reserved for God. So there's a tendency to use uh, more kind of uh, geometrical uh, shapes and designs, uh, also like very beautiful uh, calligraphic Arabic script, often passages from the Quran as a way of, of kind of uh, decorating the interior of structures. Uh, and very often the, the geometry is meant to somehow uh, depict uh, uh, Allah or God, right? So in, in this case, for instance, kind of showing the infinite nature of God. And we see here uh, geometrical patterns that don't have any clear beginning or end, right? So that's kind of the idea. Um, in fact, eventually we have a term for this kind of art, often used for the interior uh, decoration of structures. We call it arabesque, a reference to its uh, Arabic origin, obviously. Uh, but always taking these kind of uh, geomet geometrical uh, patterns, right, that, you know, that are very repetitive, keep repeating themselves, very often circular, no clear beginning or end. Uh, it might be in relief form, it might be more kind of mosaic painting and so forth, uh, but that's kind of the common element. Uh, now early on we do find structures where you can kind of see, uh, you know, they're still kind of working out what would be definitively Islamic. Uh, related to this, it's very often the case that uh, as the Islamic uh, this new Islamic civilization spreads and, and uh, takes over territory formerly dominated by Christians. That, uh, you know, early mosques might actually be converted churches. So an early Umayyad mosque uh, in Damascus, and this is how it looks today. Uh, but you know, pretty clear that it was once a church. And in fact, early on, they did actually reserve a part of it for Christian worship. I think we talked about that. Uh, you know, and by the way, this is a very common practice in both directions uh, throughout the pre-modern. Uh, period, right? So, you know, Christians converting mosques into churches and churches being converted into mosques by Muslims and so forth. Probably the most famous example of a church being converted into a mosque would be the Hagia Sophia, uh, the preeminent cathedral, if you will, in uh, Christian orthodoxy uh, up until the end of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, Constantinople was conquered in 1453 by the Ottoman, and one of the first things they did is converted it into a mosque and uh, you know I think it's pretty clear uh, for the most part it's the original church structure but it should be pretty clear what they added to it uh, that in a sense signify that it was now to be used for uh, Muslim worship and that would be the four minarets surrounding it and this structure is really quite huge it's uh, maybe hard to fully appreciate if if you don't see the real thing uh, but if you were standing in front of one of those windows right those windows would be about I don't know two and a half to three times your height uh, those tiny little windows in the red space. Uh, the Ottoman mosques are in some ways probably the most well-known uh, structurally. I mean, like, you know, in terms of when we envision in our mind or imagine a mosque, very often it, it would resemble uh, kind of uh, Ottoman structure, right? So it's these kind of uh, very often uh, more than one minaret, and that's not always the case. Uh, or a lot of domes, small domes, large domes, kind of piled on top of each other. Uh, but very often the, the uh, structure that a mosque took would have reflected the time and place of its construction, right? So here we, we see the great mosque of Samarra from 847 uh, in northern Iraq. 
Uh, and so structurally resembling very much uh, kind of architectural features going back even to the ancient Mesopotamians, right? So the minaret here uh, almost looking like a kind of rounded ziggurat uh, and obviously very prominent, right? I mean, it's the largest part of the mosque. It kind of really stands out. Uh, you know, in terms of pre-Islamic influence, this is also evident in the design of cities early on. Uh, so the city of Baghdad very much modeled on Feruzabad, which is an ancient Persian city. And you can see kind of uh, looking at it from an aerial view, you can see that it had a circular design. This is no longer a functioning city. Uh, Baghdad, which originally was called Dar es Salaam, uh, was in fact modeled on that city. Uh, the two designers were in, uh, Naubacht, formerly a Zoroastrian, and Mashallah, former Jew, both converted to Islam. And you might remember Baghdad was created as the capital of the newly established Abbasid Caliphate. This was under the second Abbasid Caliph, Al-Mansur, uh, and would be built on the Tigris River in what today is Iraq. Uh, in fact, that, as I mentioned, the name was Dar es Salaam. The, the name Baghdad actually was borrowed from a nearby village, and that's what eventually came to be known as. Now, uh, I think it's pretty clear, probably the most you know, prominent structure, architectural structure you find uh, in uh, Islamic civilization or Muslim-majority countries would be the mosque. And in fact, there are two different kinds of mosques that we can refer to. There's, you know, very often the, the what you might call the local mosque, the masjid, and that would have been to service a, a neighborhood or a small town. Uh, but then there's something more equivalent to a cathedral, uh, you know, if we're going to think about uh, something analogous in the Christian world, the masjid jama, uh, which would be the larger type of mosque, uh, you know, the one that would have symbolized the glory of Islam and be used for a very important kind of communal uh, occasions of worship. Uh, often we just refer to it simply as Jama uh, instead of Masjid Jama. Now we don't want to exaggerate uh, you know the distinction between these terms. Uh, probably the most important mosque in, uh, in the world of Islam would be the Masjid al-Haram uh, and this is the site of pilgrimage of the Hajj located in Mecca. We see the Kaaba there in the center and it's you know clearly quite large. All those little dots are people. Uh, this structure actually only dating back to 1577, so built by the uh, Ottoman. Uh, and, you know, so, I mean, just kind of considering the different forms that mosques might take, here we see the Kuba Mosque, which only dates back to the 20th century, uh, having multiple minarets. Uh, and then the Masjid al Nabawi, which only dates to the 20th century, but, uh, you know, marks the burial place of the Prophet Muhammad in Medina. Uh, so obviously there's been a mosque on this uh, spot going back to the very beginning of Islam, even if the present-day structure is fairly modern. Uh, now, to some degree, right, like there are usually certain common features, but there can be tremendous variation, even to the extent of, you know, not having a minaret, uh, very often based on local culture and traditions. So, for instance, the great mosque of Xi'an, which was built in China during the Tang Dynasty at the eastern end of the Silk Road, uh, and this is not the absolute original structure. It's been renovated since. Uh, but it's pretty clear that this is heavily influenced by Chinese architectural styles, and there's not even a dome or minaret involved. Uh, but again, you know, probably the most, uh, most famous uh, you know, kind of structure that died a mosque. And uh, you know, since we're looking at the Sultan Ahmed Mosque uh, in Istanbul, we might take a look at the interior. And this is pretty typical, right? I mean, usually it's just one huge open space. Uh, usually the idea that it should be very airy, well lit if possible, uh, in this case uh, via large numbers of windows, but uh, you'll notice also you have these huge chandeliers that are descending from a high point to just above the floor level. Uh, other mosques, uh, you know, also reflect uh, kind of local color. You might look at the Jama Masjid in Delhi. Uh, and so that's kind of recognizable as a mosque, right? But we can see it has the dome, the minarets, and so forth. And, uh, but, but in some ways very distinct, these kind of onion shapes. Uh, you know, again, probably the most common feature in a mosque would be the minaret, right? And the minaret is the place from where the call to prayer is made, the adhan, recited by the muezzin five times a day, right? These are the, you know, from the... Uh, five pillars of Islam that you're supposed to pray five times a day at set times. Uh, so you need someone to tell you when that is. Uh, you know, in you know, historically it would have been the case that the muezzin would climb to the top and do the call to prayer from there. 
Uh, today it's more often the case that they have loudspeakers up there, uh, and the muezzin is actually doing the call to prayer uh, through a microphone from the ground level. Uh, but, you know, the minaret, of course, is very prominent. In some cases, almost disproportionately so compared to the rest of the mosque, as we see here in the Hassan II Mosque in Casablanca. Another important uh, feature that we find in every mosque is, is the mihrab, which indicates the qibla, or direction of prayer. One should always be facing Mecca uh, when praying. Uh, so, I mean, which wall this would actually be located in, depending on uh, what part of the world you're in, right? Uh, but very often, like particularly if we're looking at it from a Western point of view, we, we would find it on the Eastern wall. Uh, another a common feature in a mosque is the minbar, uh, which is effectively the pulpit, uh, just as you would find in a church. You know, the pulpit is where the priest would stand. The minbar is where the imam would stand to lead the prayer and deliver sermons. Uh, and usually it's pretty ornate. It might be like a small tower with a pointed roof and stairs leading up to it. Uh, very often richly ornamented, you know, very elegant. Uh, though, you know, in a very kind of simple, uh, you know, unadorned mosque, it might simply be a small platform with a few steps, right, just so that the imam would be somewhat elevated. Here we see uh, kind of the details of a mimbar dating from 1091, and you can see it's actually quite beautiful. Uh, and finally, we should uh, consider the, the part of the mosque that makes up most of its structure, uh, at least in the interior, the musala or prayer hall. And you can see here with a, a mihrab in the corner. Uh, so, you know, a number of things to note about it, right? Usually just this very open space with no furniture whatsoever, right? The idea is to allow as many worshippers as possible. Uh, and very often you'll see very little in the way of images uh, of people, animals, spiritual figures, you know, the idea that nothing should distract you from focusing on God when you're there. And of course you don't need furniture because the, uh, the position usually assumed uh, as a Muslim when praying is to kneel and uh, to become prostrate, right, uh, prostrate before God, a kind of way of showing your humility. Uh, and you, very often, like, the floors will be quite nicely carpeted, so, you know, it's a very kind of warm environment, very comfortable. You would be expected to take your shoes off before you went in. Uh, I do want to point out, you'll notice that there are many people uh, in this particular musala who are not praying, right? So, you know, mosques very often kind of a place where people just come to congregate. So you pray for a while, but then you might go off into the corner and, you know, speaking in low tones out of respect for those praying, uh, but engage in other kinds of uh, activities, more, you know, kind of socializing. Uh, as I mentioned, right, you would take your shoes off, you would also clean yourself up before going in. At the entrance to every mosque is an ablution facility, uh, a place where you can kind of wash your hands, uh, your arms, maybe your face, and possibly even your feet, uh, though I think that's not as common anymore. You probably keep your socks on. Uh, another structure common to the Islamic world is the madrasa. Right uh, here, we see a modern one in Bosnia and Southeast Europe. Uh, but uh, I do want to clarify: like historically, it would have been affiliated with a mosque. Instruction would have been first and foremost in Islam, right? But today, the term madrasa simply means school, right? So, uh, for instance, much ado was made of the fact when Obama was president that he, president that he had attended a madrasa as a child in Indonesia. Uh, as if this was somehow evidence that he was Muslim. This was you know, no more proof of that than uh, someone's attendance at a Catholic school in the United States uh, would somehow indicate they're Catholic. Uh, you know, there probably would be some minimal amount of religious instruction, but for the most part it would be a you know, very tip typical kind of secular curriculum you might find in any school. All right, so like here you see there is a small part of this modern madrasa uh, that constitutes a mosque. Uh, but, but very likely there would be, you know, there could be any number of students there who are not Muslim or who are Muslim and not particularly religious. Uh, with respect to higher learning, uh, the structure, uh, the term uh, jama refers to university. And again, you know, pre-modern period, it would have referred to, uh, you know, kind of more religious instruction, but, uh, but at a much higher level. Uh, but today it often is just used to designate any kind of university. And by the way, you might notice the similarity between the term jama for mosque and jama'a for uh, university, uh, both referring to uh, have the same root, the verb meaning to basically like collect people in one place. Uh, so not even really having a particular religious connotation.
Uh, so today, if you went to a JAMA, it very likely would have a very typical, primarily secular kind of curriculum, would be structured very much like, you know, universities in the United States with kind of set classes, set times, and so forth. Uh, back in the day, it would have focused on Islamic learning, again, of a higher order. Uh, if you were to attend a JAMA, you would uh, probably have a mentor, an Islamic teacher known as a sheikh, which literally just means a kind of uh, respected elder individual. Uh, the lesson would have probably been very informal, not highly structured. Probably uh, all of the students would be gathering in a circle around the sheikh. Uh, while he expounded on some finer points of religious learning, and you would just try to gather as much knowledge as you could. Uh, you would be sitting in what's known as a majlis, literally reference to kind of place of sitting, or plural is majalis. Uh, a number of jamas that are kind of worth point, uh, kind of pointing out today, you have the Jamat al uh located in Fez, Morocco. So this is considered to be probably the oldest, I should have said, jama. Uh, continuously running in the Muslim world, dating back to 859. Uh, and, you know, this is an example of a jama that still used primarily for religious instruction, uh, but of a higher order. Um, we might, if we're talking about, you know, kind of educational systems, there wasn't like at least one attempt to kind of systematize uh, religious instruction back in the, in the day. If we go back to the Seljuk uh, dynasty, uh, in the 11th century, there was a vizier, Nizam al-Mulk, uh, who actually tried to kind of systematize religious learning through a uh, kind of collection of institutions known as the Nizamiya. The main one would have been based in Baghdad, but there would have been other affiliated institutions throughout the uh, throughout Seljuk territory. Uh, you know, and this also did facilitate kind of greater interaction between members of the ulama who became affiliated with this kind of system of learning. Uh, I might mention that uh, Nizam al-Mulk was actually assassinated by one of the uh, seveners, the Hashashin, who we talked about, uh, the Ismaili uh, Shiite sect. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, it was a Shiite sect, the Fatimids, uh, I should say, should say Shiite dynasty, the one established in Egypt that uh, were responsible for establishing Al-Azhar University in 988. Uh, though today that is probably considered the preeminent center of Sunni Islamic learning, right? So, uh, you know, a lot has changed since then. Uh, and finally, we might mention one last structure, the Caravansari, uh, which were basically the equivalent of Motel 6s back in the day. So if you were a merchant traveling between two cities, for instance, uh, and you weren't able to get to your destination one day, you would need a place where you could spend the night feeling secure, maybe finding basic uh, you know, nutritional needs uh, for yourself and perhaps your animals before traveling on. So these caravansari were built at, at various junctures for that purpose. Uh, so you can see structurally, right, it's designed primarily the exteriors for defense, pretty much uh, you have uh, places where you can store goods and foods and, and even, uh, you know, find rest for the night in the interior, uh, which would have, uh, you would access these various cubicles through the open courtyard. Here we see a caravansary from the uh, Safavid period in Iran. Uh, and I thought we'd finish up by looking at a number of structures, mostly mosques, uh, but, you know, that really represent, I think, uh, the beauty of Islamic architecture. We might start with Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, I mentioned that the Dome of the Rock, I think I mentioned that it was part of a larger complex called the Haram al-Sharif, and the dome itself is not a mosque. It uh, actually marks the spot from whence, whence Muhammad alighted to heaven, but there is in fact a mosque at one end of the complex, and that would be the Al-Aqsa Mosque, or Far Mosque, a reference again to the passage in the Quran about Muhammad's night journey. One of the oldest uh, mosques in the world that's, you know, entirely intact, the Ibn Tulun Mosque in Cairo, uh, actually predates Cairo, which was built by the Fatimids. Uh, this mosque was built in uh, Fustat, a garrison town established shortly after the Muslim conquest of Egypt. Uh, Cairo was built nearby and basically swallowed it up. So today you would visit the neighborhood of Fustat in Cairo if you wanted to see this mosque. Uh, here we have the Imam Mosque in Isfahan in Iran. Imam, a reference to, and I'll be honest, I forget which Imam is buried here. Uh, circa 1611 uh, from the Safavid period. 
A uh, very typical uh, feature of Iranian mosques is the use of blue tiles. And the, the kind of shape of the dome that you see there is also very typical. Uh, here we have a mosque uh, in India, and I kind of put this here just to demonstrate that you know, religious extremism is not uh, a problem of any one religion. Uh, the Babri Mosque in India was destroyed in December 1992 by Hindu extremists. Rather unfortunate incident. Here we have the mosque from the uh, Ulog Beg Madrasa in Samarkand in Central Asia. And so, you know, people who travel to Uzbekistan, this is one of the places you might go. Uh, you know, both in terms of uh, design and the material being used often reflected whatever, uh, you know, cultural influences were around, but also what materials were available. So, for instance, the Great Mosque of Genet uh, in Mali. Uh, made almost entirely of mud, right? Sun, sun baked, of course, so it's pretty sturdy, uh, but you know, it's very distinct uh, looking, it very much uh, reflects the location. Uh, we might consider also the great mosque of Cordoba as an example of a mosque that uh, would be converted into a cathedral. This is in the south of Spain uh, after the Reconquista when the Muslim kingdoms were brought to, to an end. Uh, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain to fall was in Granada, which fell in 1492. Uh, and that is the location of maybe the most famous uh, palace fortress complex of Islamic origin, the Alhambra in Spain, Alhambra in Arabic, because it has a kind of reddish color, Alhambra meaning red. Uh, but, you know, this is probably the most popular tourist destination in all of Spain. Uh, and as long as we're in Spain, we might finish with the Alcazar in Seville, uh, Sevilla, sorry, in Seville or Sevilla in Spain, uh, which clearly was of Islamic origin, but no longer serving uh, any kind of Islamic function. We should also mention Sinan, right? This is probably the most famous architect uh, of the pre-modern period. Uh, he served four Ottoman sultans, so this guy was around for a while. Uh, his masterpiece is considered to be the Selimiye Mosque in Edirne, uh, Edirne which is in uh, Turkey today. Uh, though he's probably more famous for the Suleiman Mosque in Istanbul. And we should know, too, he was also a great engineer. He was really good at designing mosques to be resistant to earthquakes. Uh, he's also responsible for the Sultan Ahmed Mosque in Istanbul, uh, which is quite beautiful. Uh, here we see another mosque, uh, the Mosque of Al Hakam in Cairo. Uh, and then uh, this is not a mosque, even if it resembles one, the Taj Mahal in Agra, India, uh, which is actually a tomb. Uh, but uh, I, if I recall correctly, built for the uh, beloved wife of a Sultan. And then finally, we might finish with a, a very modern uh, mosque, you know, of a kind of smallish scale. This is located in Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, and I'm not sure. I think when you think about it, you're like, yeah, that could be a mosque, but it's not obviously evident right from first glance. So we'll stop there. Uh, and, you know, just to let you know, there could be questions on the, uh, ne the second exam related to this particular lecture, and we don't have any reading corresponding it to, to us. So the, uh, the PowerPoint slides will be available on Blackboard, but it is quite imperative that you did uh, view this lecture. Uh, obviously, if you got to this point, you, you already did, so no need to tell you. But uh, just to let you know, there could be something on the exam from this.